Okay, so we left off before um, talking about Ponzi schemes. So we're going to just recap and review a little, little bit about what Ponzi schemes are. So basically Ponzi schemes are when a person, um, they start the Ponzi scheme, they have an investment firm or they have a, they have a um, hedge fund that they might be managing, they have some type of company um, that has investments. So what they do is they get other, they promise high rates of return, so they get other people to invest. And most people want, they're out looking for places where they can put their money that's going to earn them a high rate of interest. Because um, you can't get a, a high rate of return at a bank. So if you open a certificate of deposit, a savings account, or a money market account like we talked about in the last unit at a bank, they pay very little interest. So people that have, especially people who have a lot of money and they want to make more money or they have, you know, what we might consider a lot of money, they want to make more money, the, the, they're looking for something with a high rate of return. So this Ponzi scheme is very attractive to people. They don't know it's a Ponzi scheme but so that, because they think it's a legitimate operation. So they invest a lot of their money and they're, you know, they're making money. And so they tend to not take it out because they're making more money. Okay, but unfortunately, well, not fortunately, all Ponzi schemes eventually get caught. They, sometimes it takes a while, but they always get caught. Unfortunately, a lot of people in the process, victims, have lost a lot and have been devastated. They may have, they've lost their life savings, they've lost all the retirement, you know, older people that don't need to be working have to go out and get jobs because they've lost all their money in this Ponzi scheme. So it's very devastating for a lot of people before it gets caught. But it always does get caught and there's three ways, instances that will occur that will uncover the Ponzi scheme. Okay, the first one is the promoter of the scam will vanish with all the invested money. So that person that perpetrated the Ponzi scheme will just disappear. They'll just go somewhere, you know, they're pro and they'll ne never find them. They may probably on some island by themselves somewhere because they probably had enough money to buy the island. So they're living this lavish lifestyle somewhere. They've just taken everybody's money and they're gone. So um, that happens sometimes. Another way is the scheme will collapse as investments slow and promoters have problems paying out returns. So how this happens, and this probably is one of the, how a lot of it does happen, is that person that perpetrated the Ponzi scheme, um, they're taking the money and they're using a lot of it for themselves and then if somebody happens to ask for some of their money back, they use the investments that they're getting in, the profits from that to help pay that person out. So that even makes it a little bit more legitimate in the eyes of the people that are investing in it. And also they get greedy, so they're spending more and more money on themselves. So they're, they're living, the, living this lavish, lavish lifestyle, so they're getting more greedy. Plus they have to constantly go out and sell and get more people to invest in their Ponzi scheme. So some of that collapses, they spend too much money on themselves, um, they, you know, somebody, at, somebody starts asking for the money back and they don't have enough in the pot, so to speak, to pay that person back, then a lot of times that's what happens is it collapses and that person is uncovered as being a fraud. And that's how uh, Bernie Madoff, the one we talked about that perpetrated the largest Ponzi scheme in America, um, that's how he got caught, was um, it just collapsed. And then the scheme is exposed. So the government has, um, they go out, they have entities that go out and um, audit investment firms because the investment industry and the stock industry is highly regulated by the government. It is. And we'll learn a lot about that when we do the stock market game uh, later on in the year. But they will send these people out, these auditors out, examiners, to go out and, um, you know, look into how this um, 
investment firm is doing because there's certain guidelines that they have to go by. And sometimes they're able to um, expose it that way and uncover it. And they actually did audit um, Bernie Madoff's firm, um, but he, he was so highly regarded in the industry and he was so good at it with how he covered it up that they, they weren't able to catch him at that time. So those are three ways that the Ponzi, Ponzi schemes can get caught. And again, they always get caught. Okay, so then another type of scheme that um, happens is chain letters. And chain letters used to be more popular. I used to get a lot of chain letters in the mail years ago. Not so much now, but I guess you can do them by email as well too. So how a chain letter works, it's kind of a type of pyramid scheme. So they ask the recipients who they're sending the letter to, to send them money. And not just them money, but there's, there's some names, there, there's a list of names, so maybe it's went to these 10 other people and it's asking, so you get the letter and it's asking you to send a dollar to these 10 people and then send the letter to 10 other people and then your name's gonna go at the bottom. So the other 10 people that you send it to um, hopefully will send dollars in. So eventually, as it goes down the chain, if everybody doesn't do it, it, it falls apart at some point. But the only people that really get money is, if, is the people that are higher up in the chains because it eventually just collapsed. So it's uh, something that's not as popular now, but it does occur. So be, if you get something in an email that's asking you to send money somewhere and then send, forward it on to your friends and it promises you that you're gonna get rich, that's a chain letter. Okay, and then there's an administered pyramid scheme and this is um, not as uh, well known or prevalent as some of the other pyramid schemes, but it does occur. So this involves a person or company who administers the scheme. So they're the ones that um, starts it and they're the administrator. And they are going to get a percentage at just for doing, just for setting it up and administering it. So it collapses much more quickly because it just depends on that one person uh, re than regular pyramid schemes because um, pyramid schemes, it starts depending on people down the chain, down the, down the ladder. So here's an example of an administered pyramid scheme. Okay, so Joe sets up a fake company, Company X. So it's pretty easy to open a company. You can go down to the tax office, you can get a tax ID for your company. You can, you can even use your social security number as a sole proprietorship. And you can find a name for your company. So it's pretty easy to open a company. So Joe goes down and opens a company and he calls it, we'll say Company X, and he starts promoting it as a very profitable business. So, and you can do that. You know, you can get flyers and you can uh, send things to people you know saying how profitable this business is. And so he's recruiting people to invest in his company. So that's kind of how that works. Okay, so then we have elevator schemes. And elevator schemes can also be called straight line matrix. They're not as uh, well known or they're not out there as much as uh, pyramid schemes and some of the other things are identity theft, some of those things, but they do happen. And an example of this, they offer to an opportunity to buy a product for a small percentage of the cost based on the pyramid scheme. So an example would be you may purchase this product, we'll say an iPhone for 15% of the normal cost once you recruit 10 people to purchase the item as well, okay? So somebody's, you know, saying, okay, I'll give you an iPhone for 15% less if you can get five other people to purchase this item as well. This means the first person is able to purchase the good when they get five people, the second person can purchase the good once 10 people have joined, and so on, and so on, and so, that's how um, the elevator scheme works. Okay, some tips to avoid pyramid schemes. Okay, if it sounds too good, I'll just tell you, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. 
Okay, so but some of the tips that here is being aware of any scheme which requires an investment in a franchise in order to be paid for recruiting other investors. So the key thing is if you have to recruit other people, that's a red flag. Okay, so if it's asking you to go out and get other people to do it also, that's a red flag. Avoiding plans which require you to spend money on high price products offered by the company which hires you. So if you're hired and they're asking you to, to buy products, that's probably might be a scheme. Finding out if the plan involves a training program. Researching the company involved before signing a contract. So make sure you research the company. There's Better Business Bureau, there's Yelp now, there's a lot of places on the internet that you can go to find out if this company is really a reputable company. Um, so do your research. Again, call the Better, Bureau, Better Business Bureau about the company. So just be aware of certain things. Make sure you know what you're investing in. Okay, so then we have affinity fraud. This is any type of investment scheme which preys upon members of identifiable groups by using their affiliation with the group. So like a group, like a um, religious organization or a club of some type is how affinity frauds usually go. It involves one person gaining the trust of others by having a similarity and then betraying them in a financial transaction. So they're, built, they're building their trust because they have this thing in common. They're a member of this club and they, they join this club and they're a member of it and they um, build trust that way. Can be completed by friends, colleagues, or anyone you trust. So unfortunately this is a sad thing because it's a lot of times uh, instigated by someone that you trust, a friend or a, a work colleague, somebody that you, you start to trust. So affinity fraud is committed by individuals using the theory of you can trust me because I am like you. Because we all tend to gravitate towards people that we have things in common with, um, that like the same things that we like. So we share the same background and interest. I can help you make money. So they're saying, you know, we're all like, so I can help you make money. I can do this for you. And you trust them. So it's harder to detect due to the tight-knit structure of many groups. Individuals will try to fix problems within the group rather than reporting the scheme to the authorities. So even though, because that's their friend, even though they think something is not exactly kosher or not exactly going the way they think it should, they would are less likely to report it to the police than they would be to try to solve it within their little group. Because again, they trust that person. They think that person is their friend. So some targeted groups would be religious affiliation, minority groups, career associations, community clubs or organizations, youth groups, the garden club, uh, parent-teacher association, any group. Someone joins and they're trying, they're, they build a rapport with this, this group, they have things in common with them, and that's, they're actually doing that so they can, can defraud them through um, the affinity scheme. So here's an example of an affinity fraud. A man comes to a garden club, so it's a garden club, meeting, say he is interested in joining. In most clubs, they want, they want new members, right? That's, that's the idea. After a few meetings, he tells the club he has used Grow Big fertilizer, okay? And his garden has grown incredibly. So they trust him, and so he says, you know, this, this product has made my garden grow, and so all of the people in the garden club are interested in that. He happens to sell the fertilizer in bulk shipments, which cost $2,000. But since he is selling it to his friends, he will only charge them 1000 so he's telling them that he can buy this in bulk for $2,000, normally $2,000, but he's going to sell it to his friends in the garden club because he wants their gardens to grow big too, that he's going to only charge them $1,000. So that seems like a really good deal to them, and they trust this person because he's a member of their club now, and so they do it. 
So many of the other members of the club want their gardens to grow too, so they offer to buy the bulk shipment and split the cost. The man explains he has to have the $1,000 up front. Okay, that's one red flag. They want the $1,000 up front before he can place the order, so the members willingly give him the money because they trust him. The man is never seen again and neither is the $1,000. So if there is 10 members in that club that give him $1,000, he's made $10,000 pretty quickly. You know, if there's 20, that's $20,000. So unfortunately, that's how the affinity uh, fraud example works. So if you're a member of a club, you know, just be careful. And, and again, the, the red flag would be that he asked for the money up front. So some tips to avoid affinity fraud would be checking out everything, no matter how trustworthy the person seems, who brings the investment opportunity to your attention. So that was an investment opportunity. It's not sometimes just about money. If, um, you know, you could, they're investing in their garden because their garden is important to them, so that's an investment too. And they're investing $1,000 to make their garden grow. And they, it didn't happen. They were defrauded. Not falling for investments which promise spec spectacular profits or guaranteed returns. Being skeptical, skeptical of any investment opportunity not in writing. So you want to see something in writing. Being wary of investments pitched as once-in-a-lifetime opportunities. Once-in-a-lifetime opportunities. Again, if it, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. So then we're going to talk a little bit about identity theft. This refers to all types of crime in which someone wrongfully obtains and uses another person's personal information. This is the fastest growing form of fraud in the United States. And it can come in many forms. And one reason why it's the fastest growing is because the internet and um, the accessibility, the new technology, it's good, but it's made it somewhat easier for people to get a hold of your information. That's why people are so, you know, almost paranoid about, you know, putting their information out there. And used to, you know, you would put your social security number on, the, on forms all the time. And now, a lot of times, it just asks for the, the last four numbers because there are, um, they don't want, you don't want to, they know you don't want to put your full social security number out there. Um, you know, there are some times that you have to in different situations that you need to be very careful, especially if someone calls you and asks for your social security number over the phone. You never want to give anything out over the phone. Your driver's license number, your social security number, anything like that. So identity theft may have the following impacts on an individual's credit. Misuse of an existing credit account which causes increased credit balance. So if someone gets your identity, then they're charging up credit cards. They're charging up, you know, they might, might buy a car on your credit. Personal information being used to open new accounts which may cause a decrease in credit scores and late payments. So we all have a credit report. There's, uh, and you all have a credit, everybody has a credit score if you, if you used credit before. And that's when you go to get a loan, um, go to buy a house, that credit score is very important <coughs> because um, that creditor or who you're borrowing the money from wants to know that you're a good credit risk. And if your identity theft has been stolen and you don't know it, that might be when you find out because they're saying, well, your credit score is... 500 and something because you have all these credit cards out there that you hadn't really been making the payments on. And then all of a sudden you find out that um, your, identity, your identity has been stolen. So um, it can cause a decrease in your credit score, which is not good because we, we all want to strive to have a high credit score. Okay, so we're going to stop there and continue with identity theft a little bit in a little bit more detail um, in the next um, video because um, it is something that again is the fastest growing and we're all susceptible to that um, that and some of you probably know people who have been the victims of identity theft I think in another class there was a couple that their parents had been or their grandparents had been